Good afternoon, all. Uh, yes, this is going to be immensely enjoyable, isn't it? Because apparently I've got to be humorous as well, um, which is quite worrying. I did think of bringing a red nose or, you know, some cards and do a trick. But we'll try our best anyway. Right, so I'm in charge, apparently. Here we go. Oh, thank you very much. That's lovely. Next. There we are. So I'm sort of revisiting to a certain extent where we were in 2018, where I was talking about why I thought there were various threats to the UK um, from insects in particular coming in. And we looked at things like the World Wide Web and ordering all these products online from outer Mongolia and them actually being delivered without coming through customs and the like. And, you know, back then my, my main thoughts were that the increasing world market in wooden goods and everyone seems to love wood, don't we all? But, you know, people look at that and think, oh, that's better than plastic, I'll buy that. What they forget is wood has to be grown. OK, we have to have oil wells for plastic, but wood has to be grown. And the thing is, a lot of these products, particularly coming in from the Far East, from China, they're grown very, very fast, which means they have an awful lot of sap wood in them, and we all know what that means. And there's attendance risks with drying and with lapses in phytosanitary procedures. Um, basically, no phytosanitary procedures. Otherwise, um, we wouldn't have certain companies doing heat treatments for us, would we? <laughs> so, you know, there's also possibilities that I see of changes in global climate that seem to be affecting things. I'm getting called out to timber yards by our pest control business, where you look at the timber yards and the timber producers, and these are people I've known for 30, 40 years, and they've got lovely yards, but they've now got problems and they don't quite know why. So something is going on. And the inquiries I was getting running at a few a year, that sort of thing, they're now coming through at a few a month. Um, so there's, there are things going on, there are things getting through. Um, so back then, really I wondered, why are we seeing more powder posts, more longhorn, more bark beetle? And was it increased awareness? So we've got all those people who apparently sit on a Sunday night and they go on the internet and they look up what it is that we're actually going to go out and look at in their property on Monday morning. We knock on the door, they open the door and say, oh, I'm glad you're here. I'll tell you what the problem is. Um, don't bother with any of your kit. Um, lower quality timber. Define quality. Um, Yes, as we saw in the slides earlier on, if you're looking at old growth timber compared to new growth timber these days, it, it just doesn't compare at all. But would you define fast grown timber, which is 100% sapwood, as being low quality? It depends on what you want to use it for. An incorrect or no kilning. If you're rushing the timber through, if you're growing it as fast as you possibly can, very often timber is not even getting killed, it's just getting processed through and everybody keeps their fingers crossed. Um, or is it an increased request for wide poured hardwoods such as oak? And again, a lot of the timber yards I go to now, they are majorly into oak because a lot of the consumers in the UK are majorly into oak. They've seen it on these um, programmes you watch on the telly, sorry, where you do properties up and everyone says, oh, look at this lovely bit of oak. And somebody says, oh, yes, you need to put that in green. It will dry out with the property. It'll look lovely with bloody great big cracks in a few years' time. So where I'm beginning to think is it's, to a certain extent, quite a bit of we've got really, really keen on wide-poured hardwoods, followed by incorrect or no kilning, and with a little bit of the armchair experts. So if we talk about air seasoning and kiln, kilning of hardwoods. Um, Dr Norman Hickin, who I was, I'm just about old enough to remember and just about met in his last days with our company, he actually wrote about respiring tissue in his book in 1954. Now, I don't know why he didn't include those uh, paragraphs in his later books, but his very earliest book talked about this respiring tissue which is so important for powder post beetles and bostrychids. And without it, you either will or will not have any starch, which is what they're feeding on. 
Um, and there's a picture of good old Norman talking about the life cycle of um, common furniture beetle, which, strangely enough, is how Renticle, well, Woodworm and Dry Rot Service started out, was he went out doing talks like we're doing today, and afterwards people said, oh, can you pop along and have a look at our church for us? And that's effectively how the industry started. Now, interestingly, at the time, he suggested that an increase in powder post attack may be due to more rapid kiln drying of timber at elevated temperatures, which fixed the starch. And the other thing was he obviously talked about what it was in particular with powder posts that attract them to the timber. And Norman was an absolutely brilliant artist. These are his scraper board drawings. I've actually got a few of these. I was lucky enough to get them. And he's drawn a picture there of the, well, what it's meant to be showing is the female um, lictus going along the surface of the timber. There are the pores coming to the surface of the timber. And she's mandibulating the surface of the timber to sense if there's enough starch in the timber. Now, no one knows if she actually, because we can't ask her, no one knows if she's actually detecting starch so she's doing an amylase test, or is it some other chemical she's detecting? Because some people have tried washing timber to, to stop um, lictus attack, and it does actually work on some occasions. So who knows? But what we do know from all the literature is that you won't get lictus attack without at least 3% starch, which is why we try and get the 3% down. And I've just put a picture in there for you to show you how, your, how the female lays her eggs by using her ovipositor, which is obviously unusual for the beetles we normally deal with, and she slid her ovipositor down the pore and she's just laying free eggs, which is about the norm in the early wood vessels or the pores. So um, this business of kilning, actually, I know Gervais isn't here today, but Gervais and I talk quite a lot about powder post and boss dry kid and kiln drying of timber. And we were having a discussion about this um, when I was looking at it for a customer recently. And interestingly, I said to him what I'd been taught in the very early days um, back in the 80s. And he said, oh, no, that can't be true. That can't be true. I think it's this. And he told me what he thought went on with kilning. Anyway, God bless him, as always, he went back looking at his vast quantities of literature that he has um, access to, and he came back with a study which actually agreed with both of us, as it were. It agreed with my side of it, with what I was told, which is if you over kiln, if you use too high a temperature, you will um, keep the starch within the timber forever. And also, interestingly, showed that if you don't um, air dry properly, you can also fix the starch. So it's a bit 50-50. So we came up with this paper by um, E.C. Harris. It was a very large paper from 1961, where it's the only place we could find where a, where, um, a scientist actually did proper tests. And he found the optimum temperature for kilning was 40 to 43.5. Now, I remember that when we last had a really big problem with powder posts in this country, it was after the Second World War, when all of the North American hardwoods had been stuck in North America because they couldn't come over, and they were suddenly released to the UK, and they were absolutely riddled with powder posts by that point. And we then got massive amounts of powder posts in our timber yards. And this is where this all came up with, well, you know, how is it coming in cycles? And why do we get cycles? And that if you correctly kiln dry at a moderate temperature but keep your humidity high, which apparently is very important, you will deplete your starch. So with global warming, the way I was looking at it was, um, and you know, with the weather we've had this year and some of the clients I went out to see, if lack of humidity can cause the cells to die quickly and therefore they cannot respire and lose their starch, is it at all possible that um, global warming has something to do with that? If the sun shines too much, there's too much heat. Because certainly we found after um, the problem with America, it was that people were using the wrong kilning cycles for hardwoods. And it wasn't their fault. You know, when you invent a kilning cycle, you give it a try and go, oh, yeah, this wood looks just right. It 
It's not till several years later that you suddenly find you've got an infestation you didn't think you should have, and you go, was that the kilning cycle? And eventually, um, what was by then BRE um, and FPRL find out, found out that there were kilning cycles you should not use for hardwoods or anything that went anywhere near Lictus. So I said, how does this affect what we see today? Well, it's more likely that um, wood is going to be um, either unseasoned or it's wanted quickly and it's put through a very quick cycle, maybe running at the wrong temperature to try and shorten the cycle. Um, open seasoning at different times of the year, felling timber at different times of the year. You know, I was lucky enough to go to one of the last proper estate sawmills um, this year because, again, they had a problem and asked, could somebody come out? And pest control said, would I go? Um, and they were still drying timber properly, they were felling timber properly, and they were saying to me, you know, we fell the timber at this time of the year. Is that still correct then, do you think? Cycles change. Um, for me, what I felt with this particular yard was they were a lovely yard right out in the middle of the woods. They are surrounded by oak trees which will have natural insects in them and they are likely to come through to the yard anyway. Um, and of course the other thing is, as I said to you, um, waney edge timber and waney edge oak is incredibly popular now. And another person I went out to this year, they import very large quantities from France. It's from their own forests in France. They've never had a problem before. This year it was absolutely heaving. And when you looked at the amount of sapwood present in the yard, you could say, is it really that surprising? And yet we knew it was properly kilned in inverted commas, but it was heaving. And, you know, the chap said, well, shall I cut all the way in the edge? But that's what our customers like to see. It gives it a bit of character. And the answer is, well, we might just have to live with what we see. So there's some pictures I took. Um, that's the French oak in the two top ones. As you can see, we have quite a lot of lictus. And there you can see where the um, sapwood is. This is the English yard. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that oak. It has a perfect, very small amount of sapwood round the outside, but it is left out in the yard to dry. And then eventually it is cut into slabs and they're all kept as one tree. So if anyone wants anything matching, they can get it. It's a beautiful yard, but they had problems. So, um, most of the French stuff, by the time I did get it under the microscope, and they're not the easiest to identify, even under the microscope, turned out to be Lictus bruneus. I've had virtually all species, but it turned out to be Lictus bruneus. Uh, there they are, quietly walking around the surface. One of them's doing the classic of powder post, looking down an old flight hole, looking at me if it can actually see me, and going, don't like the look of him, I'm off to hide. And it's funny, I was chatting to this gentleman about it, and I said, oh, well, as soon as we advance towards that timber, they're going to run and hide. And he went, really? And as we advanced towards the timber, thankfully, they did what I asked them to. They ran and hid, and he was amazed. And I said, no, they, they can see something. They can see us coming. And they go off and hide and dip down. But there is good news, sort of, as long as we're not worried about invasive species. When I kept the material... Um, all nicely, safely boxed up to study it and do some um, tape recordings as well. There was another beetle running around in there and eventually I got hold of it and got a photograph. And thanks to some friends I've got in Europe, because it's not in any of the UK books at all, they came back and told me, well, I knew it was a clerid beetle, I got that far, but I didn't know what the heck it was. And there was a good reason, it's from Australia. And it arrived in Europe about 10 years ago and there is sort of good news, it loves lictus, with a vengeance. Um, I watched it, and it's like the proverbial um, ferret down the rabbit hole, unfortunately, for the lictus. And it fits just right as it goes down through, so nothing's getting past it. So we actually do now have um, a beetle which eats powder post, a bit like Coronetes and Death Watch. So hopefully when I press this next, this will work. 
here we go. Thought you'd like some videos this time. Apologise for my sparrows at home, they're a noisy bunch. And just a very short one of one looking down a hole and then scurrying off. And there we are. I make a change from sound recordings anyway. Oh, well, <laughs> speaking of which, so. Um, that's the sound program, if you remember from the last time I talked to you. It just shows the spikes. Um, hopefully I'm going to play this very short clip twice. It's a bit like listening to Golden Delicious. And on this particular one, I must have been very, very lucky with where I got the microphone. I, walk, I do move it around the pieces of timber, and I must have got bang on top of one of the larvae. So there are, that's basically its mandibles rasping away inside your piece of oak. And uh, Heterobrostrychus hematipenis is back. Of all of the insects I get, um, inquiries particularly from our pest control business, you know, these are importers or shops that get returned goods. Um, in this particular case, what a surprise, a bit of wicker basket. Generally speaking, if I get anywhere near a decent photo, and these ones I took down my microscope anyway, um, they turn out to be hematipenis now. So it is obviously getting very, very common, particularly in the Far East and in China. And as, as we all know, um, wicker is made from willow. Willow is grown very, very fast. It's 100% sapwood. Yes, it gets boiled a little bit to weave it, but basically anything that likes starch, anything that likes sapwood in, in hardwoods is gonna find that really yummy. And they do with a vengeance. Um, unfortunately, most of the time, by the time I ask somebody, can I please have a sample, the stuff has been destroyed, burnt, incinerated, whatever, um, which is a bit unfortunate for getting samples. And it's also bought some Bostrychid mates with it as well. So again, um, generally speaking, I get fairly poor photographs. Um, I think this one here, from what I can see from these little prongs on the end, it's almost certainly a dimamerus, but it's probably curvy, pe um, curvy peas. And that was from India. It was one of the blocks on a pallet. And again, somebody saw it running around the warehouse and asked our pest control people, oi, what's that? And the one over here, I know even less. Again, it was just a photograph I was sent. It's an unknown species from Taiwan. So these insects, just like normal store products insects, they're coming in all the time. And finally, um, Diodorus minutus, bamboo borer in gardening screens. Um, the whole 12 pallet loads of this got incinerated, basically. Nobody wanted it back from where it had come from. Surprise, surprise. Um, I luckily got one lot. Um, they didn't even unpack it. They just sealed it in plastic bags and sent to me because they just didn't want anything to get loose. So I had the joy of unpacking one of these um, bamboo screens and then dropping most of the remainder into my freezer, which is, funny enough, where it still is a year or two on. Um, Unfortunately, I, I am very disappointed to say that this was in the middle of lockdown. I was up to my neck in COVID work for the company and I didn't tape it. So you'll have to imagine a bottle, uh, a bottle, a bowl of very fresh uh, Rice Krispies pouring your milk on. And I can tell you from across the room, the amount of snapped crackle and pop and the sound of feet moving was quite unbelievable. 
So what we have with bamboo borer is you've, again, got to get your bamboo at just the right age, just the right amount of starch, just the right moisture content, and then these will go through bamboo plantations and bamboo material no trouble at all if you read the literature. In this particular case, the bamboo had come from China. I understand it had gone to um, Spain for some reason to be made into the bamboo screens. Allegedly, nobody saw anything along the way. By the time it got to the UK, there was just so much um, frass inside the packaging that it was obvious to the warehouse staff there was a problem. Um, so you can see here, you really can't see a lot. But when I go into close-up, the larvae are in the combs. And the interesting thing is the adults also eat away. And that is the frass under the microscope. But basically it just takes it to nothing, but leaves the outer part of the bamboo intact. Yeah, we're nearly there. So another few photos I took. Um, this was actually being moved around by them as they were munching away. It was quite surprising how voracious they were. And this one decided it wanted to go for a bit of a fly. Um, it didn't get very far before I got it. But they're quite squat compared to the other Bostrykid beetles. Quite squat. Right, hopefully. Sorry about the neighbours. Unfortunately, yeah, it picks up everything, these microphones. And I've got a bit of a longer one, hopefully a bit better. You know, I know I'm a sad old soul, but I have to admit, they're interesting little beetles. They really are, you know, compared to ours, at least they stay out for you and run around and do a bit of feeding. Anyway, I'm afraid that's all, folks. <laughs>